Let's talk about tonight's resolution now. Um, first, I want to offer some context. The Oxford style of debating uh, requires a resolution be argued strongly for by one side and strongly against the other. And this is our resolution tonight. The vacancy tax will work. Um, on November 16th of last year, the Vancouver City Council passed the empty homes tax, and we are now in the first tax year. All the vision members of the council, as well as the green member, voted for it, and the three members of the nonpartisan association voted against. The tax rate is 1% of the assessed value on the property sitting vacant. The revenue, says the city, will flow into affordable housing initiatives. Homeowners won't need to pay, uh, even if they are away for large parts of the year, if their house is a principal residence. By that, um, it would be the place listed on the driver's license, tax forms, and health cards. Owners who use their property six months of the year for work but have principal residence somewhere else, they won't have to pay either. Homeowners will also be exempt, even if it is a second home, if they can prove that they or a family member have been living there for more than six months of the calendar year, or if they have rented it out for at least that much time. Uh, also written into the laws that people will be exempt if they own condos in buildings where the Strata Council had a rule in place uh, at the start of the new tax restricting rentals. <laughs> Homeowners will also be exempt. This sounds like one of those infomercials where they give you the big pitch and then somebody talks incredibly fast at the very end about all the <laughs> small print. Homeowners will also be exempt if their properties are undergoing major and properly permitted renovations or redevelopment and people who are in medical or supportive care. Now, um, people with vacant homes are expected to self-report, although there will be some checking around by officials, according to some of the news accounts I read. So how many truly vacant taxable homes are we talking about? Well, in November, when the measure passed, the city, using its way of finding out, which was to look at electrical usage uh, as a guide, they calculated that at least 10,800 homes are empty year-round in Vancouver and roughly 10,000 more are under-occupied. This month, urban planner Andy Yan of SFU's city program, using the very latest census data, put the number at more than 25,000 units. Now, StatsCan, it should be noted, defines an empty home as any unit vacant or occupied by non-permanent residents. So that might be students. Um, and I don't think it's fair to say that if a student lives there, the house is vacant. You know, there may be maybe vacant looks in the, in the unit, but doesn't mean that a student equals a vacancy. By that measure, Yan found that the percentage of empty homes in Vancouver had doubled over the last 30 years from 4% in 1986 to 8.2% in 2016. So it's, a, it's an increasing um, percentage of vacant units in Vancouver and also regionally. The percentage of vacant homes Yan also found in another study nearly doubled between 1981 and 2006 from 3.2% to 6.2%. Stats Can in 2011 determined that 50,800 units in Metro Vancouver were unoccupied and another 7,500 were occupied by non-permanent residents. Yan notes that Surrey has the second highest non-occupied rate after Vancouver uh, and the other cities that have seen steep rises recently um, are Richmond and Burnaby. So there's the context for Vancouver's vacancy tax, which, as I noted earlier, the mayor argued will be a way to free up more housing in an extremely tight rental market. What we'll be debating tonight is whether the measure is the right one for the job. Will it work or not? So, some words about how the evening will go, and then we'll introduce your debaters and get on with the debate. In just a few moments, we're going to ask you to vote on tonight's resolution, though, before you've even heard the debate. And the reason we're going to do that is that um, uh, we want to really measure the effectiveness of the debaters. The real winners of the debate are whoever sways the most people to their side, not necessarily who has the most votes. So we're going to ask you to vote. We're going to quickly tabulate the results and let you know the results. And then the debaters will do their best to try and change the minds of you who disagree with them. Now here's how the debate is structured. First, each member of our two-person debate team is going to give their opening statement of seven minutes. And then we're going to have kind of a 
messier middle period where they um, have their own exchange and I interject some questions and then I'm also going to invite you in the audience to get involved. So be ready to uh, challenge the debaters or ask them questions. And then to sum up, each debater will be given two minutes and then you'll vote again. Okay, does everybody understand the rules? All right then. I'm now gonna invite each of you to cast your vote and the place to vote is here. Well, as of now, before the debate, 32% of you think it's a great idea. 68% of you do not. That's surprising. So 32 of you are pro and 69 are con. And uh, we'll see if that changes by the end of the evening. As I said, um, the winner of the debate will be, any, will be the team that manages to sway the most people to their direction. So let's uh, fill the vacancies on the stage. Let's meet those teams. Um, they are smart, they're knowledgeable. Um, I can assure you that in the case of each and every one of them, the lights are on at home. Someone is home. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's debaters. First, the pro side. Christine Duhame and Jens von Bergman, come on down. Christine Duhame practices, is a lawyer who practices in Vancouver and Toronto, advising on, among other specialties, financial crime, legal compliance, and market regulation. Her teammate, Jens von Bergman, is president of Mountain Math, a Vancouver-based data analytics and visualization company with a focus on urban affairs. A big round of applause for Jens. And now, arguing against the resolution, the cons. Kirk LaPointe and Sir Somerville, come on down. Kirk LaPointe is top editor at Business in Vancouver. He hosts a Roundhouse Radio FM talk show, and you may have seen him sort of on the TV a lot in 2014. He ran for Vancouver mayor under the NPA banner. Sir Somerville is associate professor and holder of the Real Estate Foundation Professorship in Real Estate Finance at the Souter School of Business at UBC. So a big round of applause for Kirk and Sir. And I've known Kirk a long time and he's trying out kind of a gravelly, gruff voice Yeah, I've lost tonight. my voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> By the way, I'm really appreciative of my face being under the word con here. In the vote. So we, we want you to know we're going for the sympathy vote. Yeah, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> it's not like I won the election. <laughs> so you can find extended biographies of all the debaters in your program. But uh, on to the first segment of the debate. Now, each debater will be given, as I said, seven minutes to make an opening statement. And I encourage you in the audience to take notes, actual or mental, as some of you will be given an opportunity to challenge the debaters with your questions and comments later. So we begin with Christine Duhame arguing for the resolution. Begin. Thank you. Um, I feel like I'm starting on the wrong side already, so bear with me. Anyway, uh, the tax is obviously, in my opinion, a very good idea. I hope to persuade you uh, to come on my side and agree with me. Um, so I apologize for the slides and having to look back and forth, but um, uh, I'll breeze through this in seven minutes. So the, it is a tax on a house, not on a person, first of all. So if you're feeling really personally attacked, you can relax. It's, it's on your house, goes on your, your property. Um, and despite what we heard, uh, despite your feelings, 63% of Vancouverites uh, support it, according to statistics that the city undertook, if, if that's to be believed. Um, no no, no uh, slight on the city there. But um, anyway, I think if we asked real people, uh, the statistics would be much higher than 63%. 
So there are some exemptions that we went over, so I won't go into that, but some basics so that you understand what the issue is that Vancouver is facing and why I believe this is a good idea. Um, Vancouver, uh, sorry, we'll get to that. Um, so Vancouver ranked third in, uh, as in terms of an unaffordable city in 2017, uh, pretty damn high. The media describes it as a crisis, and it is. Uh, a lot of us regular people can't afford an apartment, obviously we'll never be able to afford a home. It makes a big difference to us in terms of where we decide to live and where we decide to start our businesses. The key factor in unaffordability is speculators buying homes and leaving them empty. Uh, not a new fact, we do know that. There are, uh, according to uh, recent statistics, 25,000 homes that are either unoccupied or under-occupied. And 51% uh, of the residents can only afford to rent, uh, me being in that category, despite having, you know, I think a fairly good professional job. Vancouver has one of the lowest vacancy rates, which might sound kind of cool, but it isn't. It just means there's very little apartments out there to rent and very little homes to rent. And we have, lucky for us, the highest rental cost in the whole country. So the reason it makes sense is for three reasons. The first one is humanitarian reasons. It helps us in the homelessness situation. So the homelessness rate is very high, record highs in Vancouver. Close to 2,000 people are homeless. You walk by them every day, you see them. It impacts us all. Um, so the reason why this is really good is that if we can tax the homes and create uh, it creates capacity for renting. So the city has uh, done some studies, I think from KPMG or one of the accounting firms, um, and according to their statistics, the empty home tax would mean that 1,500 to 4,200 units would become available to rent. If only 2,000 came available to rent, the vacancy rate would uh, increase to 3.5%. So it's gonna create a, you know, a domino effect where if more units are available for rent, more people can rent them. The shelters that are actually filled up with people that have full-time jobs would be released and the homeless would be able to come on board and get off the street. So the result, number one, is the empty home tax means that enough units, there actually will be enough units to solve the homelessness crisis in Vancouver. If we subsidize that, we could get everybody off the street. I think that's a bloody well good enough reason, number one. Number two is law and order. So um, Vancouver, you probably saw this about a year ago, that we are lucky for us, a money laundering hub, and it's not getting any better. Uh, it's getting worse. So the reason why it makes sense to have an empty home tax is that it deters financial crime. So Vancouver is a magnet for money laundering. It attracts foreign nationals who come to Vancouver and park their money in expensive real estate. Again, that trickles down because it affects the price of housing, makes it more, more less affordable for all of us. And obviously they're engaging in criminality if they're bringing proceeds of crime into Vancouver. They unfortunately leave a lot of the homes empty. They often pay no taxes. In fact, according to statistics we've looked at um, that CRA and uh, Immigration Canada provided, they pay less taxes than refugees. So under the regime for the city to uh, implement the empty, empty, empty home tax, the auditing system is going to look at homeowners and determine whether or not they are resident or not resident. And anytime there's an audit system over any type of uh, home ownership or whatever it happens to be, it deters any type of crime. And that's because monitoring stops criminality in its, uh, in its feet. So the result of the empty home tax will be it'll reverse Vancouver as a money laundering safe haven and improve our reputation. The third reason why it makes sense is that it supports British Columbia technology. So Vancouver is also a magnet for talent, a huge magnet for with huge technology companies that are setting up head offices here in Vancouver from the United States and from other countries. But we are losing our technology talent over the uh, housing costs and only over the housing costs. So our tech jobs will increase from 100,000 to 200,000 by 2020. Uh, tech in BC is 11% of Canada's GDP, that's phenomenal and could grow if we play our cards right. 12% of our economy depends upon it, but millennials are leaving Vancouver to go to more affordable cities where the jobs are shittier, excuse my language, um, and graduates from other places, top universities that are being lured by, place, by companies like Amazon aren't coming here because they, while they're getting great salaries, while they have a great education, they cannot afford to leave to live here. So our businesses have to pay more to retain talent, which means that they are retaining less talent and we're not able to grow in the tech sector. So by 2025, this is kind of a weird statistic, but 20, 85 out of 88 tech jobs that are gonna be existing in Vancouver will be unable to be filled by people that live here. So those tech jobs are here, but we, no one will be able to come here and take them because they won't, won't be able to afford to live here. So unless we solve our house, housing crisis, we will not be a great global tech leader that we could be. Increasing the vacancy rate makes housing affordable to all of us and it keeps the technology in British Columbia. So the third point why you should uh, vote for the resolution is that the empty home tax helps build the future economy of British Columbia. 
So in a nutshell, there's three really good reasons why you should support the resolution. Number one, humanitarian. Obviously, it will help people uh, get off the street and into homes and help the shelters be uh, changed around so that the people that have jobs can afford units and we can help the homelessness crisis. Number two, it helps Vancouver being, uh, be a leading city for innovation. And number three is it helps us no longer be a center uh, for financial crime. Thank you. Thank you. And under the wire. But no, Kirk, you don't get any of those extra minutes. No, you don't carry them over, huh? Okay, Ready? fine. Start. <laughs> you good to go? Go All ahead. Right. There we are. So thanks a lot for your invitation today. Um, I am suffering from a very sore throat. It's not to build sympathy for the team. Uh, it's legitimate. Um, but I hope my voice doesn't give out in the next seven minutes. I start with the premise that the empty homes tax is one of two things. It's either a bad idea poorly executed or a poor idea badly executed. It is uh, likely one or the other. It could be both. It is not neither. Um, we can start our critique by recognizing the city administration has not identified a single new housing, social housing project in its eight years. It merely builds on previously identified one. It has a congested permit system that often delays projects by two or three years. Um, it has pointed fingers at other levels of government while sitting atop land worth billions of dollars. And when the call came for housing projects, as it did late last year from the province, the city proved itself inept and ill-prepared in answering the call. It has alienated the province fully. Uh, it had alienated the federal government fully, but it had waited out, waited for a change in the federal government so that it might re-enter the housing market after an absence of decades. Ottawa will do so soon, but much later than necessary. So we all waited too long. But the city needs a distraction, and it found one. That being said, to be fair, it has governed during an era of accelerated mobile capital. And that's made our city an attractive, secure, geographically strategic place in which to invest. But the largest housing issue we face, the one that would spur rental units and minimize the price increases if it were addressed, is the inadequate supply. It's fairly simple. With that in mind, um, I want to talk about uh, the criticism that's pouring in. With affordable and plentiful housing, the number one concern municipally and provincially, the city felt obliged to act. It couldn't possibly have thought, though, that what it was going to do would really be effective. But political entities often make assumptions, and the city's, city had some. The city's assumption was doing something, anything, appears to be good. And having done something, anything, it can usually also bank on the following, that people are not going to look under the hood of a lemon. And I would argue that the city homes, the empty homes tax uh, really isn't the issue that we ought to be discussing in a certain way. It, the empty homes are, in fact, a big issue in our community. The latest census data uh, reveals an alarming level of empty properties in the city. It's possible that even more than the 25,000 that were counted in the census might exist out there. Rental vacancies below 1%. It's an unacceptable and problematic rate. And I'd argue, though, that the tax, all I'd argue is that the tax is not going to be effective in either spurring rentals or housing starts and that it's going to have some unintended consequences. Part of the fallacy of this tax is that it's somehow going to bring some meaningful dollars to find the way to build housing that we desperately need in Vancouver for those of limited means, low-income singles and families, the elderly, the homeless. The city has promised that net revenue will go to affordable housing initiatives, but its own financial projections are extremely thin gruel. They're very vague on this. And I suspect for very good reason. There is not much money to be had on a low tax, lightly applied, heavily administered. I suspect the net revenue for housing initiatives is bound to be smaller than were we to, say, add on one city block a densification of a neighborhood, gently. But of course, no politician these days wants to tell the neighborhood it needs to densify. It is much easier for, to penalize those who are absent than to be candid with those who are present. Secondly, the proposal calls for uh, of the, uh, a tax of 1% in the appraised property value. This is the key reason I say this is all uh, being done for appearance's sake, because the notion of a 1% tax 
is going to be, it, 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 the notion that a 1% a tax would be sufficiently consequential to spur owners to become landlords is a conceit. You know, face it, if your property is appreciating in value by 15 to 20%, what is a 1% tax to keep it pristine, to avoid all of the stress that comes with being a landlord if you don't want to do it? No, you're going to pay the tax. It's going to be a cost of doing business. And because it's a relatively light tax in a context of appreciating property value, it will not deter you as an investor to buy and leave vacant. No, if the city were serious, then the tax ought to be serious. The ugliest part of the tax, the part I most reject, is that it's going to turn us into a city of snitches. Neighbors will be alerting authorities to empty homes. Inspectors will be visiting properties. Auditors will swoop in when, uh, when we don't self-report our empty houses. This takes the worst element of strata culture, of pitting neighbors against one another, of vilifying owners, and applies this citywide. We become Snitchville. Our city bird is a stool pigeon. <laughs> and when I say the culture is applied citywide, I, I need to amend that somewhat because one of the weaknesses in the tax is that it is so meagerly applied and, it, and so mightily expected to deliver. A raft of exemptions undermine it, and as my debating partner was going to argue later on, the tax raises questions about the intrinsic legal rights of a property owner. Can you force someone to fill a home any more than you can force someone who owns a car to drive it? Which brings me to overhead. The tax may not be creating housing or revenue, but it's going to create jobs in administration, enforcement, and litigation. The bylaw has, equivalent, has established the equivalent of a whack-a-mole game um, of the arcade by identifying those to be penalized and assessing their penalties. It will take a lot of effort to get very little in return. And the reason that it's going to take a lot of effort is that it has so many exemptions, and we've gone through them. But one of the, the ones that I want to point to, the one that probably causes me the, the greatest concern, is that in a lot of ways, it, you, if you're a, a, a strata owner, uh, you will find that actually you will be exempt from this if you have a bylaw in place for rental. Uh, this is one area that I think the city didn't actually consider when it started looking at this. Yeah. All right. So my conclusion then is that um, it's not going to satisfy either objective here. It is a tax for public relations purposes, and while it wouldn't be the first time governments have tried that, we're not going to solve the issue by papering it over so cynically and incompetently. Okay, you can hear my phone making a terrible sound at the yeah. moment. That's you going over. All right, thank you very much, Kirk. Jens, it's your turn, seven minutes. It's my pleasure to um, argue that the vacancy tax will work. Um, I want to start off by really looking, at, taking a little step back and looking at the background of why we're in this situation. Why are we even talking about the vacancy tax? So how many vacant, vacant homes do we have? We've heard several numbers. Well, we have two separate data sources that mainly that inform us about empty homes. One. Uh, one is the census, the other one is the study the city um, <coughs> commissioned to, uh, using BC Hydro data. So the census in the 2016 census enumerated 25,000 homes not used as a principal residence, or the primary residence, and uh, the BC Hydro data yielded about 10,000 homes. They deal with slightly different um, properties out of which these were measured, but overall they paint a quite similar picture, which is somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of our building stock is not properly used as residential, um, primary residential use. Well, so how does this compare if we are looking um, across Canada? Census data gives us the ability to compare across Canada to see how other cities stand. And um, if you look at the graph, um, you can see Vancouver, the third from the top. Um, I've uh, marked it there. Um, it does end up on the high end in the comparison. It is not a complete outlier. So why is this an issue? Well, context matters. And the context that we have in the city of Vancouver is our rental vacancy rate. Um, Rental vacancy rate is made up out of two rates, really. It is the um, often cited CMHC vacancy rates that deals with the purpose-built stock, 
but it also, uh, there's a vacancy rate for the private stock. If you combine those, um, that's what I call now here the effective vacancy rate, which is what really matters to you as a renter if you're looking for a place to rent. And it is extremely low in the city of Vancouver. It is nowhere near in that range that we're looking at. If we're looking at cities like, for example, Halifax, that um, looks is quite healthy, just about in that 3% range. Um, Edmonton is maybe even a little bit too high. It's great for renters, not so good for landlords. So coming back to compare our cities here, if the rates in Halifax or in Edmonton are higher than in the city of Vancouver, that doesn't really matter much because these rentals, oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, all right. this vote, please. So sorry. So let's go back to the. Um, let's go back to the. Um, you get an extra thirty seconds. Yeah. Um, to the vacancy rates here, um, just to see what we're talking about. Um, and so the city of Vancouver vacancy rates are extremely low. Um, so if we're looking at in the comparison again here, where we see the cities, um, Vancouver as being quite. Uh, not an outlay here. We see Edmonton and um, Halifax with higher rates. It does not really matter that much because the vacancy rates are much lower in those cities. So the need for those homes is really not there that we have in the city of Vancouver. In fact, some of those vacant rental units are part of these vacant units. These are the good ones. These are the ones we want. We want those vacant ones from our vacancy rate to show up here. So let's actually put them in. And in green here, we see which portion of our rental stock, of our vacant stock, is actually available for rental. And it's the ratio between the green and the blue that really shows why in Vancouver the um, vacant homes are such a hot topic. We can put in the city of Vancouver and some nearby municipalities at the bottom here just to see how um, more localized in our context um, this fares. And we see the city of Vancouver, there's very few rentals available, and there's a lot of homes that are not used as primary residents. So what else do we know about these um, homes that are not used as primary residents? We have a fairly good idea of their geographic distribution. <clears throat> we know why some of them aren't used. Um, aren't used as primary residents. Um, it was already said earlier by David that um, some of them are occupied by temporary residents. Some of them might be students. Some of them might just be people that use this as a vacation home. And um, some of them will be subject to tax, others will be not. It's about a fifth. About maybe up to another fifth, if we want to be generous, of vacancies are simply due to people moving. A lot of people move in the city of Vancouver fairly regularly. For three-fifths, we don't really know what exactly the reason is. Um, we can look more at changes of vacancy to get some more ideas. An important hint that we get from that is that new buildings typically have higher vacancy rates, older buildings, they fill in over time. Like we can see here in Coal Harbor that is slowly filling in, still. We can also run a model to estimate the rental tax revenue that this could generate. Now, taking out the um, people that move regularly using historical data and also looking at the um, dwelling values and folding them in, we can get a pretty good idea that using census data we would end up with about $340 million. Now, this is an overestimate in many ways, mostly because not all of these are subject to the tax. More realistically, maybe about half of them, maybe about at the range of $100 million, $120 million. Um, are subject to the tax. On top of that, we have vacant lots. These six vacant lots on Belmont Ave alone generate a million dollars a year. There's no house on top. These are held by investors. We, oh. we are in a rental housing crisis. Um, there's broad agreement that something needs to be done. But I do notice a large empathy gap between owners and renters. So what does the vacancy tax do? It's a very simple thing. It simply says, if you use your property, we have different tax rates in the city of Vancouver depending on its use, whether it's residential or commercial. The vacancy tax simply says, 
If you leave your property vacant, then it is commercial use. It is not residential use anymore, and we will charge you the commercial tax rate that we already have in the city of Vancouver. That is effectively the vacancy tax. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jens. Right on time. Thank you. All right. Well, um, excuse me for a moment now while I shift positions here. David. Come on. I get to speak too. Oh! <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to stand next to you while you talk. That's all. Um, I just thought you guys had given up, but no? <laughs> all right, then if you insist, go ahead, start. Okay, can I start? All right, so um, I think uh, I'm going to present this as an economist, which is usually a bad word, but hopefully there will be some there in it. And I think I would like you to think about um, the marginal benefits of the proposal, what it could actually achieve relative to the costs. And uh, the problem I have around the whole question of will it work is the extent to which the possible gains are relatively small, and they're conceivably costs that may be very, very large in a long-term sense of how we relate to individual rights uh, and individual liberties. So first of all, when you talk about crisis of vacant homes, this is a crisis of vacant homes, right? This is not the kind of situation that we're dealing with here. It's not the South Bronx, it's not Detroit. Um, Historically, even though the vacancy rate that Jan talks about as being very, very low is true, um, we've seen this before. And so it's not as though we're now at a permanent place in terms of the apartment vacancy rate in Vancouver that we haven't seen before. We've actually even seen lower numbers in, in the early 70s. When did we see earlier lower numbers? When the baby boomers were uh, in their 20s. And a lot of what we're facing right now is a, um, just a problem that we have a lot of millennials in a system that hasn't allowed us to create new rental housing very, very quickly. And so Supply housing to those people. But if you look on a historical note, we're not necessarily at a crisis point relative to where we've been historically. Um, as well, if you look at the census data that Jen and others have talked about, I think the thing to highlight here is the increasing number of vacant unit of uh, uh, homes that aren't permanently occupied is occurring across uh, Canadian cities. So we've obviously got the, the missing numbers there are Montreal and, and a variety of other cities. And with the exception of Calgary, every place we had an increase in the number of units that weren't occupied by regular re residents. So this is not a problem that's unique to us. And so that it's very hard to think that a vacancy tax is going to solve something that really looks like to be a larger uh, pattern than we see in this city alone. Um, our short-run crisis that we're facing right now is, is fundamentally a demographic crisis. Uh, and it's a demographic crisis in a context where our ability to provide new housing uh, is very, very limited. Now, you know, but like everything else, old people like me blame millennials. Uh, and so uh, we've got a whole bunch of them, uh, and it's an increase. And when you look at that increase, it's an increase that's, that's occurring at the same time we're not providing uh, new units. But it's also a temporary problem. Right? Because after we sort of get through this millennial bulge and they move on to home ownership or whatever else the sort of next stage is, we're not going to have very many units. And I kind of don't like a situation where in, a, when in an environment where all of a sudden we have a very small number of potential renters, we're going to be taxing people for having vacant homes. Right? Now you could say, well, of course we'll get rid of the tax. Just why we got rid of the property transfer tax only two or three years after it was proposed in the 1950s. Getting rid of taxes is a hard thing to do. There's a lot of inertia in them. Um, the other aspect of this that I think makes the crisis uh, particularly acute right now is Alberta. The downturn, downturn, downturn in Alberta has meant a, a dramatic increase in the inflow of Canadians into here in a very short period of time, which is putting pressure on rental markets. That's a pressure that you can't expect to turn around very, very quickly. And if you add up those numbers, they're greatly in excess of what we would expect to see um, be added to the vacant supply through a vacancy tax. So how proactive has the government been? Because they're all, at least one of them apparently is listening to us according to this picture. Um, so here's the zoning map in 1974. Right? See all that gray? That's single family zoning, single family land. There's a zoning map in 2014. And I challenge you to identify the difference beyond the fact that the, there's a big part that's Shaughnessy that's now purple for heritage preservation. So fundamentally, we haven't addressed the change in the demographics, the change in the population, the change in our city over time. And that, if we want to sort of make things work, we have to get at that. And the dealing with the, um, the, the, the relatively small number of vacant properties is not the sign of sea change that we need. 
So vacancy, I don't think, is in dire by historical measures. We're dealing with cyclical factors. And you know, we still define Vancouver by single family houses with big yards. Uh, and if we, you know, we choose to replace that with large houses, that's not necessarily addressing the problem. And that's a land use issue, not a vacant homes issue. So what's wrong with the vacancy tax? Uh, so this is a bunch of economist stuff. Um, so basically, the key thing here is that economists tend to think that we need government intervention in, in markets when the markets don't work. That we tend to believe that markets are an efficient way, it's not the same thing as a fair way, it's not a just way, but an efficient way to allocate resources. And we interfere in these markets when there are various reasons why the markets fail. Um, and these can, there are various types of, of common categories, either market power or asymmetric, asymmetric information. So the question is, what's the market failure here that demands intervention? Well, when we look at inter, uh, historically in land use, we t have tended to intervene in order to deal with negative externalities. And what I mean by that is a situation where one property imposes a negative effect on adjacent properties, whether it's a noxious use, whether it's pollution, uh, whether it's a high density that puts uh, stress on city services, the way the property is being used is causing hardship to other people. Uh, the thing, the thing is about the vacancy tax, this is to be the first step to essentially taxing people for not doing something. So rather than taxing people for doing something and essentially restraining their property rights because they're taking actions that have a negative effect, here we're essentially going to say that you're, now your property rights are not only limited to what we won't let you do, but we're, we're forcing you to do. So even the choice to protest by not doing something is being limited and being infringed upon. And I think that that's really, really problematic. I think when I look at the Costs, I think this sort of sea change in the way we're treating individual property rights um, is, is problematic. Now, I, I think there's certainly space to say that, that we have an acute enough problem and this solution is going to solve the acute problem to maybe take that step. But what I would submit to you is whether the, the, the given the type of problems we have with housing affordability, whether this particular measure right, is the type of measure that warrants this kind of significant change in the way we approach property rights. And I would submit to you that at the very least it should cause you to think. So I'm not going to say whether or not the costs outweigh the benefits here. Right? I think that's an individual assessment to, to make. Um, but what the individual, what you can't avoid thinking about is that there are aspects about this tax that take us in a direction that we haven't done before. And you have to ask yourself is whether or not you think this, you know, somebody who has a $4 million house that they're leaving vacant, whether or not this tax is really the kind of thing that's going to force them to make a change in that. So the question. Right, is really what we can do, what we can't do, but what this does, does is sort of doesn't allow us to even have the protest of not doing. Thank you. Um, I have to. <laughs> I have to admit that you did prepare some remarks and probably deserve to be able to present those. So, so I'm sorry I tried to prevent you from talking earlier. That's, that's all right. You know, I just didn't know. Yeah. No, I come from a tougher city than this one, so it's all right. <laughs> All right, I'm moving my chair to the middle here. Yeah. Hi, everybody. We're going to have an exchange. Um, I'm going to start it off by um, putting the question to Sir. I mean, you you pointed out this this large map of uh, area zone for single. Oops, zone for single families. Isn't it exactly, isn't that exactly the point of the, the vacancy tax is that these single family residents are what are being bought and kept as sort of hedge assets and wouldn't the taxes on those because they have such high values actually generate some real revenues to put into affordable housing? So I think that entire statement is full of speculative um, concepts about just why units are vacant, how I many there are. I shouldn't have let you speak. I should, really shouldn't have let no, you speak. No, you shouldn't have. <laughs> so, so you, know, you know, if you look at the counts, relatively, the, the, the vast majority of the counts of vacant units are the condos, not the single family. So already, if what we're thinking about is addressing sort of, you know, expensive money Money laundering through single family houses, that's not where the vacant houses are in the city. What that map is showing you is where the land is and how the land is being used. And if you want to address affordability, you have to use the land better. The land is the scarce resource. And it doesn't look like we're doing it all that much different than we were in 1974. And I think that is a more acute issue to address. Okay. Um, 
Christine, um, what about Kirk's specter of the, the snitch society? I mean, you made an argument that actually monitoring, we could actually uh, step up our monitoring because there's, this place has become a haven for money laundering. Are you, as a legal person, are you worried about this, um, the specter that Kirk raised? I don't really see us becoming a snitch society. I mean, it didn't even occur to me that I'd be snitching on my neighbors because what's to be gained? What's to be gained out of it? I think what I meant by the audit system is the city, though, um, is supposed to have this administration system that's going to go out and you know check whether or not you live there and, and audit your house and ask for ID and ask for all sorts of different addresses and stuff like that. So I think that. I don't think that so much as a snitch system as it is going to be, a, a hopefully, a comprehensive and, and well-administered audit system. Actually, it's going to be called the Barbaric Housing Practices. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And uh, Kirk, you were um, critical of the 1% tax, saying it wouldn't have um, a big enough effect. Well, what, what tax would? I mean, um, well, you have to take a look at who you're, who you're targeting with the tax. So you're targeting, for the most part, high net worth people. Um, they're investors, particularly. Uh, a 1% tax for them is one of two things. A reason to go into court and um, fight it, or a, just a nuisance, a cost of doing business. Um, what kind of a tax it would take? It would take a much larger tax to dissuade high net worth people from buying a place, leaving it vacant, and not somehow renting it or occupying it. And 1% is, is simply going to create an administrative apparatus without necessarily contributing to the two social objectives that we seem to have here. One, to build the housing that we need for those who most need it. And secondly, to increase the rental stock. But wouldn't, wouldn't somebody trying to decide whether to buy uh, a a property that they want to leave vacant, scanning all of Canada, looking at that map that Jen's put up there of, of um, other cities that also have fairly high levels of, of vacant homes. Why wouldn't they just buy somewhere else instead of Vancouver and thereby relieve that pressure here? Well, because other places in Vancouver don't have 15 and 20 percent appreciation on property value year after year. Do we still? We do in many levels of housing, yes. <laughs> Um, I'm going to leave, uh, I'm going to open it up so that uh, I can get out of the way and let you two debate teams pose questions and challenges directly to each other. Does anybody want to start it off? Yeah, Jen. Yeah, I, um, I've heard some um, notion of that this vacancy tax imposes um, somehow on people's property rights and that it's unprecedented in that way and I just simply don't think it is. Um, I would like to argue that we already tax property based on their use. And we've done this for a long time. If you have a commercial use in your property, you get taxed a different rate than you are if it's residential, if it's industri light industrial, heavy industrial. These uses have different rates. Simply what we're doing is we're saying <coughs> you will not be afforded the preferred residential rate if you do not use your property as a residential property and leave it vacant. I'm not, I don't think in any way that this is interfering with people's property rights. I guess the, the question is, is that I mean, you're essentially assuming that just because I tax you, that's not a restriction of your, your choice set. And I think, you know, the taxes inherently are there to, uh, control, to affect people's behavior. Um, and in affecting their, their behavior, you're essentially making a, a statement about uh, what you are at some level allowing them or not allowing them to do. And the, the difference here uh, is that the example you give between industrial and commercial uses, you could um, make the, the, the statement that those are taxed differently because of the, whatever burden they put on, um, on, on, the ta on city services or a variety of other ways in which tax rates are, are, are defined, but they're about a use. And here we're talking about a non-use. And so it's, you're, being, you're taxing somebody for what they're not doing, not for what they're doing, and that is a fundamental difference. And, and I'd add to it that the housing stock that you are buying is in fact classified as residential when you buy it. You then may make a choice with it. But, but to then determine that in fact the residential property you bought now becomes a commercial property by virtue of the fact that you leave it vacant. 
is something that I think will be tested quite severely. Right, but that argument would say that rental housing should be taxed as commercial housing too, because that's a commercial exactly. activity. Yeah. And so the, the land use code here is one where um, the, the tax is on the type of use, not the objective of use. Any responses to that? Well, I have one. I mean, what, if, if, if what you're arguing is that people should be not taxed um, for what they're not doing, then you and yourself sound, it sounds like you yourself are arguing for doing nothing. And um, we are in a crisis, are we not? Well, I, mean, I, don't, I think what I'm, what I'm proposing, is, suggesting is that it is a large step. And I think in taking the large step, you should ask yourself is, is this tax in this form at this rate you know, going to solve what we, what, what, what we understand to be a, a large problem? So it's not whether or not taxing in and of itself is a problem, what, but it's whether this mechanism right, at this tax rate um, is worth the step that's, in, that's involved. And I don't think anyone here, and I know no one on this earth, who's going to be able to give me a good estimate of, you know, based on data of just how many people's behavior this is going to change. It's entirely speculative. Uh, just, to, just to kind of add on to kind of what we said earlier about the um, kind of maybe the whole uselessness of it. It just seems to me from Joe Average's perspective, of which I am a Joe Average, if if this is a huge administrative thing that the city is undertaking and it's you know a waste of everyone's time and money and it's going to break even. Who cares? Let's just actually do it then. Because even if it is an administrative nothingness that creates all this administrative work and we end up with a break even, what we're forgetting is that at the end of the day, there will still be something like 4,000 units that get opened up, again, to help people get off the street, again, to help people have jobs, again, to help the economy, to free up space. So who cares if it's a break even? I mean, to me, it's like, OK, then let's do it. Because the break even is fine. But at the end of the day, what we're creating is a lot more units for a lot more people to get affordable housing in the city. Well, first of all, I mean, of the, of the 25,000 units that are now identified in the census, we really don't even know now how many of those units would qualify to be taxed in this case. All of the ones that would be covered by strata are exempt. Right? All of them. They're the ones that have rental clauses in them. Pretty well every strata has a, has a rental, and, and, uh, and the larger strata that would have several units are likely fully uh, uh, versed in the number of rental units that they already have. The idea that there is a, a great gain in housing here, I think we might be misleading ourselves. We might be using this 25,000 figure to say, ah, that's, that's the objective. We might be able to get quite a lot of those 25,000 in there. I'd say we, we need to drill into this uh, considerably before we begin to speculate on what kind of an impact there would be in a tax like this. So I, I, I actually have two questions that I'd like to raise. Very quickly, but I'd like to give them a chance to respond. So no, we don't, no, we're, yeah. We're, yeah. Okay, uh, I would like to actually go, go back again a step and talk about um, the idea that there are other things that we could and should be doing um, to address our housing and rental okay, crisis. Okay, but you're not responding directly I am to, responding what, to, to what Kirk's saying? Okay, to okay. what Sue was saying earlier. And David, was actually, okay. David was actually, uh, Kirk was responding, actually yeah. not asking a question. Okay, right. all right. It was actually our turn to ask a question. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the vacancy sex does not preclude any other action. I, th I think it would be great to have to talk about things like opening up um, single family housing, but um, that's a different debate. It's not today's. And I don't think in any way the vacancy tax precludes that. What the vacancy do tax does, it is one way to add more supply and to do that fairly fast. It, does, it accelerates the rate at which new buildings start to get occupied by adding this extra tax on these units. It is a one way of how somebody who moved away from Vancouver um, but still holds on to that property here because they might come back maybe thinks about renting this out or selling it to return it back to the market. This is, it's, it's nudges these people back, in, these properties back into the market. And it does that fairly fast, fairly efficiently, without having to build anything new, wait till it's done, discuss a whole new policy about how to open up, say, single family housing like you suggested, which are all great things and they need to happen at some point. But this is something that we can do now and that can have an effect fairly fast. So I mean, the, the problem I think we come back to is, is what effect it will have is entirely speculative. 
Right? So yeah, I, I, I am sure that there is going to be some number of units that are brought to the market through this tax. I actually have no idea what that number is because I don't really know the, what sort of high wealth people's uh, sensitivity to this kind of tax is. And I would submit that there is no one in the city who actually knows either. And I don't think there's you know, anyone on this earth who actually really knows the answer to that. So I think that that is entirely speculative. I wanted to raise an objection and ask the, the, the question here that it was, it was two things were suggested. Number one, that this was important for saving our tech sector. Um, now, when I look around North America, you know, the, the, mar the city that has sort of the highest problem with rents and the lowest vacancy and the biggest problems in this area is San Francisco, which seems to be doing fairly well in the tech sector as, as far as I'm concerned. So it's very hard for me to sort of, you know, get a sense of why sort of our rental market is necessarily, you know, going to deter uh, the, the, the tech sector when other cities um, that are worse off are doing very well. The other, so I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about sort of that dynamic. I think the other piece is how is it that essentially getting some people to, to put you know, expensive west side homes uh, out to the, the, the rental market and high end condos, how is that going to address homelessness? Because you submitted that we have a problem with homelessness and we really have to get the homeless up and, and this would help. And so I'd like to know how that's going to work. Does anyone answer the second part first then? Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, relying on our, our good city, um, according to our good city statistics, uh, those are the numbers that 1,500 to 4,200 are units, units are going to be made available if this tax is imposed. So I, I'm not a person that deals with stats, so I, I can't really say. Um, but I think that it makes sense if we're releasing units to the marketplace and if we're changing whether or not people are going to come to a place like Vancouver and buy expensive real estate or not. I can tell you that in terms of uh, foreign nationals, any any type of a hint of a tax of any sort of government imposition, the people that want to move to Vancouver are not. Like, that is certainly a deterrent. Um, but in terms of the numbers, I have no idea. That's the city statistics on how many units will be made available and what impact it will have on people being able to rent in Vancouver. Um, I, I agree with Sor that um, it is very hard to estimate exactly what the effect will be. That is, the split of how many of those vacant homes that are subject to the tax will um, somehow return to the market and become occupied and how many of them will pay the tax. Um, the city has said they will continue to monitor the situation. The tax rate is an initial tax rate that we impose. If the city sees that this does not work well, this can be adjusted. Um, I don't think that just because of some of these unknowns, and like David pointed out initially, we are in somewhat uncharted territory in North America here, um, where it's very difficult to um, understand the exact effects up front. I don't think that that is a, a good reason to object this. Um, if nothing else, this tax is also a great way to collect data. What it does is it allows... And, and, who, and who could argue with that? <laughs> <laughs> what it does is it gives us a very clear idea of how these properties are used and what, um, at what point people are willing to release them back into the market. And um, this will inform how we in the future can better deal with these issues if in the first round the effectiveness does not measure up to what we would like, to be, like it to be. Jen, well, you have a much greater faith in the accuracy of self-reporting than probably I do. <laughs> okay, we'll have to have another one of these after we've run the experiment for a couple of years and look at the data and see how, see how it's worked out. But in the meantime, let's have some questions from the audience. According to Tony Giovantu of the Canadian, or the Condominium Homeowners Association, the Liberal government, without consultation from any people in stratas, but listening to their developer friends, in 2010 changed the rules so that any new strata developed after that point was not allowed to put in rental restrictions. So anything built in the last seven or eight years is open season for Gregor Robertson's tax. You're actually, you're actually taking, uh, taking me on. You're taking Kirk on. But, but you know, well, no, you made the comment. No, Kirk actually no, Kirk, did, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. They're on the same team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 I get to choose to be on it. No, 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 no. The city, the city's look own, out, the city's own uh, um, uh, literature on this says that uh, any um, any strata unit that does not have a rental um, uh, bylaw in place by uh, the end of 2016 uh, is essentially susceptible to the tax. So, so you're not wrong. Yeah. 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 
just pointing out that there are a significant number of new stratas that are yeah. not allowed by provincial law to rent. Uh, to I guess, rent. I guess what the, the question I throw around on this one and trying to think um, whether the city acted like a checkers player or a chess player was, <clears throat> so what if these units come on the, uh, the market and the owner decides that the rent uh, will be $25,000 a month? Who's going to do something about that? I mean, what, 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 did, what did the city really think it was doing here? So it might spur some people to put their property on. Is it going to rent control them? Is it going to require that they, that they have a market rent? I didn't see that in any of the literature so far. And if that comes, then we all better be fearful all over the place, not just in what they're going to do in this particular case, but what they would do citywide. Well, it simply requires that the place is rented out. The owner can set the price. But somebody needs to live there in order to avoid the tax. Right, so he would still pay the tax if he... If, if the own, he or she put Listen. out a sign saying this is for rent, but asked for twenty-five thousand a month, and no one rented for for months, they would pay the tax until someone did rent. Is that what you're saying? Until somebody actually okay. moves in, okay. rents and moves in. All right. For six months. Six months. Yeah. <laughs> well, for okay. in thirty periods. Anybody else? No short-term rental. No questions. Yes, right there. You could have the mic if you want, but it's going to take a second to get there. Yeah. There you go. Um, Two-part question, actually. Um, I'm new to Vancouver, but I research homelessness and re refugees in Vancouver, and also affordability. And one first question is, um, can someone please give me a number of what is affordable housing? Like, what is affordable rent? And then how does that um, correspond to low income, to people living on benefit, and will this tax actually, it, it just seems like it's going to free up apartments and houses that are going to rent for 2000 to 3000 a month, which is way, way more than people who are in the desperate need of rental will be able to afford. So. so the question was, what is, what is an affordable yeah. rent for low income people? Basically, okay. so if we're addressing affordability right. with this tax, right. uh, will it be sufficient? Like, will we be able to have more uh, affordable, and what is affordable, rental units through right. this tax? Okay, so is the vacancy tax going to really make a dent in opening up <coughs> low rent units? Yeah. Okay, so, so who wants to take that on? Um, yeah, okay. I, I'd like to take that on. So to your first question, generally affordability is, is a floating thing and it's tied to incomes. Typically people think about it as maybe 30% of your income spent on housing as a um, ballpark measure. Um, so a lot of these places that if they um, get turned over into the rental market will probably not rent at rates where low income people will be able to afford it. What does happen, though, is as the stock of apartments that are available for rental widens, it does free things up at all levels. So there will be some effect that can be felt throughout. Um, but this particular part of the tax will not um, address the needs of people that the current market generally cannot supply housing for at a rate that is affordable to them. It will be quite hard. It will have a small effect on that. But the other part of the tax, which is the housing affordability fund, the people that do not open up and that um, generate money there, that is designed to help for ha with housing that is below market rates. So in that sense, it also addresses that. So the revenues from the taxes is would be invested in subsidizing social housing. What well, is earmarked for the affordable the net, housing the net fund revenues. that has Pardon me? the net revenues? Right. So the, 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 the administration of this is, is probably going to be relatively expensive, uh, and so the, the, the net benefits, in you know, if, if you if what you really wanted to do was impose a tax that would raise a lot of revenue to help low income uh, people, this would probably this would not be the way that you would do it. Uh, you would do something that was much more broad-based uh, so that you could raise significant number, amount, amount of revenue. You know, so having said that, the part of this that will have the most direct and immediate benefits for low-income people is that part of it. Um, had the city listened to a bunch of eminent economists who suggested that starting the tax at 2%, they'd have more money and it'd be more effective. But. Yeah. Um, 
just to talk again about the administrative costs, this is actually something that we can estimate fairly well, and the city has, and they've estimated it's about a little over $4 million for the first two years, and about a million dollars thereafter annually, what the administrative costs for this tax would be. And um, I think as I've tried to outline, the tax revenue potential vastly outpaces that. Um, just these investment properties on Belmont Ave alone generate a million a year. Um, and I've run some models just to try to understand generally how about if we think 10,000 homes as a number subject to the tax, how that would affect things. Um, I don't think there is a problem of not generating um, revenue. No. The city has not, um, pardon me, the city has not calculated uh, litigation costs. Right here. Here comes your mic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so kind of a two-part question, and this might be a dumb question. Are we the first city to try this anywhere? No. Oh, so there must be some data on how it's worked and what's happened in those places? Yes, so um, Europe, um, there are places that have, France in general has given cities, um, some cities, the authority to do this. Um, in Paris, this has been done. The surtax in Paris used to be 20% of the property tax as a surtax. Okay. Um, the uh, government just allowed the city to um, um, raise that to up to 60%, which Paris promptly did. Now that's 60% so of the existing property tax, tax, tax yeah. not 60% of the this assessed is, uh, value. So very, let's not mix yes. up the it's one very, percent yes. with very Yes, so it's a different, okay. um, different scale. Okay. And typically property taxes, the tax rates are much higher in other places, uh, Vancouver has a very low property tax rate per assessed value. Yeah. So um, the actual hit in terms of the taxes paid is a little bit less with the 60% now in, in, in um, Paris than it is here. Jerusalem um, also implemented a tax like this. Yes. So just quickly up. So I, I, let me just point out that, that, that Paris is, is, you know, has a huge problem with uh, non-resident uh, periodic uh, occupants of, of the, the properties and that, that doesn't, you know, and Jerusalem is the same way and in both cities, I, I certainly have, you know, know, haven't seen anything that suggests that they've really put a dent in it. Mm -hmm. That was my question was around the halo effect of having this tax beyond its practical implication. You know, if you've got a town where the cop always hides behind the billboard, you're not going to speed there. So the idea of just having the tax, does that have an effect sort of beyond its practical application. So does it sort of send a signal that this, that if you're only looking to buy a property as a equity, then don't come here? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, kind of a warning shot, yeah. Does anybody have any evidence of that that you know of, or no? Well, I mean, the, the problem with this is, is that the sort of the amount of, if, if, you, if, you, if, if what we think that this issue is, is a foreign investor issue, the amount of money sloshing around the globe uh, is so large that this, you know, it, this is it's kind of irrelevant in that debate, given the type of taxes and regulations that you see in other cities around the globe that still have lots of money flowing in. Um, but there, you know, there are a lot of domestic investors. There are a lot, you know, when you look at these properties, most of these properties uh, look, look like they're, they're owned by, you know, folks in Surrey and Toronto and a whole bunch of places that, you know, don't have pinyin names. Um, and, you know, it's not, you know, I think it, it is very, very hard to figure out just what kind of effect th that you have and, and, you know, sort of hit my argument over and over again. I'm not saying that there won't be an effect. I'm just asking you to ask yourself if the type of step that we're looking at for, with this tax in this form is really going to achieve the objectives that you want or we should be putting our energies into areas that will be more effective in um, moving along the issue of housing affordability and helping out young people and helping out poor people. I think we should be doing both. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just reiterate what the resolution is, which is that the vacancy tax will work, and I think by that was meant, will work under its own, you know, under the only, the definition of, of what success was laid out by the city, which is it would make a dent in freeing up rental properties, not solving the entire global financial <laughs> picture, but, you know, that'd be nice too. 
Okay, uh, that is the end of our exchange period. Thank you for your great comments. And now, prepare, because each of you are going to have two minutes to sum up, okay? And we begin with uh, Christine. Two minutes. I Ready probably just need two seconds. Um, <laughs> I think the issue really is either we're going to be a city that does stuff, be a leader, make a change, see if it works, the law's already in place, or we're going to be a city that does nothing, of complainers. So my response to you is why don't we be leaders, why don't we make a change, why don't we go with it? It seems to me it's pretty much harmless, it's already in place, it's going to balance out what we've heard. Um, but one thing we all seem to agree on is it is going to free up units. If it's going to free up units, it's going to change the whole statistic in terms of who can rent a home and who can and what's available and what's not. So I feel like either you walk out of the door tonight and you're like, hey, I'm going to do nothing and just let somebody else look at it for another 20 years and be one of those people that doesn't vote for things uh, to change in the city, or you're going to say, yes, I, I'm going to go for it, and we're going to see if it's going to work. If not, we can change it later. Thank you. Okay. Kirk point. two minutes. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I hope I didn't lose my voice entirely. Um, so we have problems. Uh, we just don't have many solutions, and this is not one. It is political optics. Uh, it is not going to contribute the meaningful money that we need in order to build the housing that we need in the city. It's mostly going to contribute to neighborhood enmity. It's one of those ready, fire, aim initiatives that you see so often. Um, it's not going to spur rentals because the people it's aiming at, the high net worth people, are not going to be dissuaded from keeping their houses vacant by 1% tax. If it really wanted to do something serious, it would have put a very serious tax in place. Um, if they don't take it to court, they'll write the check, but they won't Keep their, they won't open their properties. A 1% tax is, um, in an era of double-digit inflation on housing value, is, uh, is just not dissuasive as a policy. Um, it will create an administrative apparatus which will be very difficult to undo one day. And so what I sense is that really what we're watching here is a 1% tax that will become a 2 and a 5 and a 7 until the city gets uh, gets the stock that it wants out of this. But in, in the present form, it's, it's going to be dead on arrival. The idea that we can meaningfully expand rental supply through this tax is to harbor a great illusion. And the method by which we are doing this does not put our best foot forward. Um, it has the potential to be divisive and invidious. There are four groups that will be very happy with this. Housing inspectors, auditors, city government, and gossipers. And, uh, and I think that we have to look for other solutions. I think we have to find them. This one just isn't it. Thank you, Kirk. Um, Jens von Bergman. <clears throat> when it's so hard to find rentals in this city, and at the same time, somewhere between 10 to 20,000 homes are not used as primary residence, I find it difficult to explain to a renter why we should extend the preferred residential property tax rate to a home that is left empty by somebody who uses it as a vacation home for a couple of weeks a year, or by somebody who um, uses this as an investment, um, by somebody who just decided it's nice to have another extra place somewhere. In this rental crisis that we are facing, I can't see how the tax rate is too low is a good argument against this tax. And I can't see why we should be doing other things is a good argument against this tax. Yes, this is only one step of the many required to help us to deal with the affordability issues in Vancouver. But it is one, and it is one that we can implement now, that the city has the powers to implement and that can have some effects now. If it turns out that the 1% tax rate is not the right rate, and we need a different one to turn more economic levers here to, to nudge people harder, so be it. What it will do is it, we are operating in an environment that where housing, the economics of housing favors owners at every level. The vacancy tax is something to change that a little bit 
and help out the people that do rent in the city. Thank you. And finally, sir. Okay, so the, the question before us is not, um, are vacant houses a problem? That's not the question that we were asked to debate. Um, the question that we were asked to debate, well, will this work? Uh, will work seems to be, def I think is defined, is making measurable and effect, uh, have a measurable effect uh, on rental markets in the city of Vancouver. And I think that's where the problem lies in that we're really in uh, very, very unsure, unclear territory on the number of units that actually will be added to the housing stock. We're not clear uh, on how many people are going to be able to evade the issue, get around it, what if I have my kid renting the basement suite? I mean, there are a lot of different ways that we might think that this might be, be, be avoided. And so we're in a space where we really don't know what the net benefit is going to be. Uh, and what we're offered is, well, we don't know what the net benefit it's going to be, but we should do it anyhow because we're facing a crisis. Um, I don't think just acting for the sake of acting is good sound policy. It's good sound policy when there's, there are no costs to that approach and when there are no negative effects to that approach. And I think it, it, it bears attention that this policy is a step in a different direction than the way we've related to property rights historically um, in this area uh, and under this um, uh, land use regime in British Columbia and in Canada. And it's not clear to me that just sort of using the, you know, ready, fire, aim approach is necessarily the way we really want to go about, uh, about doing things. Um, and I, I, I know that we're, we're not supposed to bring other things in, but I'm going to do that anyhow. So when the West, when the rental residents of the West End, you know, fight the redevelopment of a property into high density rental, right, w w you know, that is where your problem is. Right? The problem is not the vacant homes. The problem fundamentally is a reluctance of all of us to accept the kind of neighborhood change that's going to be necessary if we want to make sure that there's enough housing available for the people who want to live here. And that is a hard choice to make, but without making it, there isn't anything else that's going to work. Thank you very much, Sir Summerlin. And thank you all four debaters for an excellent debate. So now we come to the moment when you crown the winning debate team, and the way you do that is you either Remember this URL, you either vote, cast your vote online or you raise your hand for a paper ballot and someone will come to you. It's Ready, frameable. I think set, thing is. vote. The results are in and that's pretty interesting. Um, if you recall, at the beginning we asked people if, uh, where they stood and uh, 32 of you um, said that you were for the resolution, 69 said you were against. That meant 32% of you, I guess there's just about 100 people in the room, 32% of you were for the res resolution and 68% were against. The pro side won tonight by 9%. The pro side ended up with 42 people saying, yep, I'm on side. And 60 people said, I'm, on, I'm against. So the pro, the pro side... <laughs> Alternative facts. It's it's it's, voter, it's voter fraud. It's rigged. It's, it's rigged. Voter fraud. It's rigged. So the three million voters are in this room tonight. Sad. Yeah. Sad. So, so a city of leaders. Yay. Yeah, Forty-one. We got, we got Forty-one percent are pro. Fifty-nine percent are con. If you guys want to fudge it later, you can still say you won. You still had more people on your side. It's just that you lost some voters along the way. So everybody's got a way to tell. No, the problem is, is that my, my two of my co-authors argued on one of these things earlier, and they got two people to switch. So they. Right, they there you, know, you go. So they're going to well, just lord it over me now. I've just provided you alternative facts. If Thank you. you I appreciate them, you that. You can say that you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So congratulations. And uh, now uh, Ian Grace, who you met earlier, is going to award the prizes. Um, Ian Grace. Some fabulous urban area trophies. The winning team receives the Smart City Award. Congratulations. Thank you. And the second place team receives an Urbanarium t-shirt, which is very cool as well. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, great job, guys. The winning team gets a piece of brain to put on their mantle, and the second place team gets brain on their shirt as they get to walk around. So there you are.